Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, thanks to the organizers for asking me to talk at what I'm sure is going to be a really fun conference. My name is Diana Hoover, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher currently based at the ULB over in Belgium. And my research focuses on using different early universe probes and to constrain many different models, such as dark matter models. So today I'm going to discuss the main early universe probe that we have, which is the CMB. I'm going to focus on two different aspects of the CMB, the anisotropies and the distortions, and I'm going to explain how we can use these to constrain early universe physics. So just to give you an idea as to where we're going, I'm going to begin by reviewing some of the basics of the CMB, just so we're all on the same page and we all know what we're talking about. Then I'm going to go into detail about the CMB anisotropies and discuss what we actually measure when we talk about anisotropies, what these tell us, and what types of models we can constrain using these CMB anisotropies. Then I'm going to shift gears a bit and focus instead on CMB spectral distortions, which are perhaps the less well-known part of the CMB. Now I'm going to discuss what we could do in the future with a potential CMB distortion measurement, what this would tell us, and again, what types of models we could constrain with our CMB spectral distortions. So jumping straight in, in the early universe, the photons were kept in thermal equilibrium with the protons and the electrons via both Compton and Coulomb scattering. Now at around redshift of about 1100, when the universe was at an average temperature of about 0.3 electron volts, neutral hydrogen could begin to form. This would happen when an electron and a proton could come together, and the inverse reaction was no longer energetically favored because of the slightly lower temperature within the universe. So at this point, we can actually form the neutral hydrogen. It can no longer directly reionize. With this, the free electron fraction is going to quickly drop because the electrons are now bound up within the hydrogen. This means that Compton scattering becomes gradually more and more inefficient. As Compton scattering becomes more and more inefficient, the photons can actually decouple. So they break away from the protons and the electrons, producing the last scattering surface, which is the last surface in time at which these, proto these photons scattered off of the other particles. These photons have been propagating freely ever since, just traveling throughout the universe, largely unperturbed or largely not interacting after the time of decoupling. Today, these photons make up the cosmic microwave ra background radiation, or CMB, which is this background radiation we can see in every direction we look in the sky. Now, due to the redshifting that has happened to these photons, they are now in the microwave range of the electromagnetic spectrum, and they have an average temperature of 2.73 degree Kelvin, with anisotropies only at the level of 10 to the minus 5. Now, the CMB is considered a cornerstone of modern cosmology. Indeed, it was one of the main predictions of the hot Big Bang cosmology, and cemented this Big Bang cosmological model as our main paradigm to understand the universe. The CMB anisotropies, on the other hand, provide a remarkable amount of information about many, many different early universe probes. So the CMB is often considered by many to be the holy grail of cosmology because it is both a prediction that we were able to observe and it allows us to test many different properties of the early universe. So I want to focus on these temperature distortions, which I mentioned are of the order of 10 to the minus 5. So let's jump straight into the CMB anisotropies. We have several different measurements of the CMB anisotropies. The first experiment to measure these anisotropies was the COVID mission, which released its latest data in 1992 and provided this map you can see on the left-hand side. Now, it might not look like it had good provision, but this was a remarkable measurement. This was really the first measurement of these anisotropies. Then we had the second satellite, which was WMAP, which released data for nine years. There were nine different data, nine year releases for WMAP. The latest one was released in 2012, and it was this image you can see in the middle where we could really start to appreciate the details of these anisotropies. The most recent observation we have from a satellite comes from the Planck satellite, which flew between 2009 and 2013. There were three data releases from Planck from 2013, in 2015, and in 2018. The map you can see here on the right hand side is the final temperature anisotropy measurements from the Planck satellites. So there are not just the temperature anisotropies that we measure, there are three main observables we actually measure using an anisotropy mission. These are the temperature anisotropy fluctuations, which you can see here on the top left, the E mode polarization fluctuations, which personally I think is a very, very pretty, pretty image. It, it almost looks like a painting. I love this one. And we have the lensing, the lensing map as well. Now, ideally, in the future, we would hope to get a B-mode polarization map as well, but for now, we have the E-mode one. 
But from these three different maps, we actually obtain four different two-point correlation functions. Now, the two-point correlation functions are what contain the actual information. Of course, the CMB maps themselves are very pretty. But once we, we do the two-point correlation function, this is where we really start to extract all of the information. So we have a, a spectra here for the temperature anisotropies. We have one for the e-mode polarization. We have the cross one between the temperature and the polarization, which does provide independent information because the temperature and the polarization maps are not predicted to be completely correlated. So this cross map does actually provide independent information as well. And finally, we have the lensing spectra. Now, just broadly speaking, we can get many different types of information from these different spectra. Temperature spectrum, for an example, gives us information about the initial perturbations, the gravitational effects, the interplay between this tightly coupled baryon photon fluid in the early universe, and of course, a lot of information about nighttime effects that have taken place. The polarization spectrum allows us to gain a lot more insight about the time of recombination and reionization. And the lensing spectra provide the lensing spectrum provides information about the geometry and matter content of the universe between the time of recombination until today. So this is more of a late universe probe. So this was just broadly, and now I want to go into a bit more details as to the different areas of these maps that give us different information. So you're going to see several arrows appearing on the screen pointing to the main different physical effects at play here, or the physics that we can constrain with different regions. And I just want to say that the arrows are approximate, so they don't point to the exact multiple, but the overall area of the spectra that is relevant for the physics described. So first of all, we can gain information about inflation. This was this epoch of exponential expansion in the early universe. Now, the information about inflation is contained in the lower multiples. So around multiple 10, the first few multiples is where we can contain, where we can find information about inflation. Then we have the lambda CDM basics. Now this comes about from the main acoustic oscillations, these main acoustic peaks, which really describe this interplay between the photon baryon fluid. Here we can extract information about dark matter, about the matter content of the universe. So again, this is the approximate region where we can really constrain the basics of lambda CDM. Next, we have the relative abundance of the primordial elements. This is something we can constrain with the very high multiples heading up to the tail end of the temperature spectrum. And this is really nice because this allows us to test another prediction from our Big Bang, Big Bang model. And this is something we can also compare to external data sets. Then we have the time of reionization. Information about reionization is contained within the tail of the temperature spectrum and within the lower multiples of the polarization spectrum. Then, of course, we have information about neutrinos, about dark matter, and about dark energy. This is just after the main acoustic peaks. Now, of course, this is not completely disentangled from the lambda CDM basics, because we know that dark matter and dark energy are part of lambda CDM. So this is just this, the next few peaks after the main acoustic peaks. Finally, we have information about late time effects. Of course, this is going to be very dominant within the lensing spectra, which measures the effects since recombination till today, but also in several regions of the temperature spectra. For example, very, very high multiples, we can gain some information about late time effects, and especially at very early multiples where we see the late integrated sachs wolf effect at play. So this was just broadly speaking, the type of physics we can constrain with different parts of these maps. But now I want to go more into detail about the temperature spectrum. And I want to discuss several effects at play within the temperature spectrum that we can really use to constrain our main lambda CDM parameters. So here I'm going to select six lambda CDM parameters. Lambda CDM is our best model that we have to describe these spectrum. It was the blue curve you could see in all the previous figures. And within it, we only have six main parameters. So here I'm choosing the basis where I have the amount of baryons, so omega b, omega m, which is the amount of matter within the universe, omega lambda, which gives us the amount of dark energy within the universe, two parameters coming from inflation, which are the overall amplitude and tilt, es and ns, and the optical depth of reionization tau ray. I just want to mention that the choice of using the amount of dark, dark energy here is purely for pedagogical purposes, Usually within the six lambda CDM parameters, instead of the amount of dark energy, we instead use the angle to the sound horizon. So this is just a choice in order to explain the physics a bit easier. 
So when we focus on the temperature spectrum, there are many different effects controlling the overall shape. Mainly there are eight of these effects. Um, explaining these effects really allows us to see how the lambda CDM parameters can be constrained from this spectrum. So the first effect that we have is the overall peak scale. This determines the scale of the first peak. And this is given by the sound horizon, which depends on the amount of baryons in the universe and the amount of matter within the universe, and the angular diameter distance, which will depend on the amount of dark energy in the universe and the amount of matter within the universe. The second main effect we have at play is the ratio between the odd and even peak amplitude. So we saw in the previous diagram, in previous figures, that we have kind of the even and odd peaks being slightly different. And the ratio between these peaks comes about from the interplay between the gravitational force pulling things in and the pressure pushing things outwards when focusing on this photon baryon tightly coupled fluid we have in the early universe. This means that this effect is completely determined by the amount of baryons we have within the universe. The third effect to consider is the overall peak amplitude. Now, this is determined by the amount of expansion that has taken place between the time of radiation matter equality and the time of decoupling. There's an additional effect here coming from the early integrated tax wolf effect that also affects this overall peak amplitude. And this is determined by the amount of matter within the universe. The fourth effect we have at play here is this overall damping envelope, which is the damping of the acoustic oscillations after the first few of them. Now this comes about because of the damping scale at the time of decoupling, which depends on the amount of matter in the universe and the amount of baryons in the universe, and the angular diameter distance, which again will depend on the amount of dark energy and the amount of matter we have within the universe. Now it might seem that this effect is very similar to effect number one because the parameters at play, the parameters involved are the same, but the way these parameters enter the expression or the, the complete dependencies is actually different. So it is not the same effect, and we can actually disentangle these two effects within the temperature spectrum. Next up, we have two effects that come about from the initial condition set by inflation. Now, this is the global amplitude and the global tilt of the temperature anisotropy spectrum. And these come about respectively from the amplitude of the primordial power spectrum and the tilt of the primordial power spectrum, AS and NS. The seventh effect that we have at play here is one that I already anticipated in the previous slide. There at low multipoles, we have this additional tilting, which comes from the late integrated tax wolf effect. This means that this is completely determined by the amount of dark energy we have within the universe. Finally, the last effect we need to consider is this overall suppression we have, this almost exponential suppression above multipoles of about 40. Now this comes about because photons being rescattered after the time of reionization. So this is going to depend on the optical depth to reionization or tau radial. So this really shows us how these six lambda CDM parameters that can be determined based on the overall shape of the temperature anisotropy. There really is a lot of physics encoded within the temperature anisotropy spectrum. <coughs> We could do a similar discussion for the polarization spectrum and for the cross one, but for now I just wanted to focus on the temperature anisotropies. So having seen this, I now want to go into a bit more detail about the lambda CDM parameters and the constraints we actually have for these lambda CDM parameters. So what I'm showing you here are the resulting two-dimensional posterior distributions for the six main lambda CDM parameters and three derived parameters. So the contours here represent the one and two sigma confidence limits for where we believe these parameters are given the CMB data. So here we're using the six lambda CDM parameters where we have the amount of baryons, the amount of cold dark matter in the universe, this angle to the sound horizon here is a specific parameterization of the angle used within a, some cosmology codes. Then we have the optical depth to reionization, tau rayon, and we have NS and AS, which were these two parameters for inflation. On the vertical axis, what you can see are three derived parameters. This means that these are parameters that we do not directly measure from the CMB, but rather we can calculate them using the data we have from the CMB and assuming a base cosmological model, which in our case is lambda CDM. So here we have this clustering parameter, sigma eight. We have the amount of matter in the universe, omega m, and we have H naught, which is the expansion rate of the universe today. Now, the different colors you can see here correspond to the different data sets within Planck. So in green, it's the, the emo polarization spectrum. In gray, you can see the cross between the temperature and polarization. In red, the temperature spectrum. And in blue, what happens when you combine all of these together? 
And what you can see here is that we have remarkable consistency across these different data sets. So all of these data sets individually find the same constraints or approximately the same bounds at two sigma level. These are perfectly compatible with each other. And this is a really good consistency check for the CMB data that we have, because it shows us that we can independently measure these parameters with any of these three different spectras. So we can use either the temperature or the polarization or the frost, and we obtain the same bounds. This makes it extremely reasonable to combine these bands together because we can see that they are really compatible. So this is what allows us to get this percent level precision on the lambda CDM parameter constraints. So now I want to focus a bit on these derived parameters that we see here as well. And I'm going to start by focusing on the expansion rate of the universe, which is parameterized with this H0 value. So there are different ways we can go about measuring H0. On the one hand, we can use early universe probes, such as the CMB, whereby we measure the CMB, we assume a cosmological model, which in our case is lambda CDM, and we obtain as an output this value of the expansion rate of the universe. Doing this procedure, as you can see on the figure on the left, gives us a value of around 67.4 with very low error bars. This is the topmost one labeled Frank. Another approach we can use is using late time probes, where we do a direct measurement of the expansion rate of the universe, using things like supernova calibrated with Cephates, this is a famous choose result shown here, or lens quasars such as the holy cow measurement also shown in the figure here on the left. And we can see here that the late universe probes consistently find a value of around 73, 74, which is in tension with the one time from the CMB, which is around 67.4. We can see here that depending how you combine the different data sets, this tension or this discrepancy is between four and six sigma. So we were hoping that you would hope in a consistent cosmological model that all of these different approaches would yield the same value. What you can see here is there is actually this discrepancy in the measurements. This is considered by many people to be one of the biggest hints we have for beyond lambda CDM physics. Because of course, if these data sets don't agree, we have to revisit all of the underlying assumptions. And in the case of the CMB measurements, one of the underlying assumptions is lambda CDM. Now, another derived parameter that we had before was this sigma eight parameter, the clustering parameter. So this gives us an idea of the overall amplitude of the matter power spectrum on average scales of eight megaparsec of weight. Now, in the previous figures, you saw that I was using sigma eight. Now, sigma eight is going to be degenerate. It's going to depend on the amount of matter we have within the universe. So it is often convenient to introduce this parameter S8, whereby you can actually combine sigma eight and omega n. So again, there are different ways we can do this measurement. We can use direct probes, such as weak lensing experiments, or we can calculate this parameter using the CMB and assuming a cosmological model. And once again, we find a slight discrepancy. The value from Planck is substantially higher, or is slightly higher than the value obtained, for example, from the kids biking measurements or from the dark energy survey year one data release. I should mention, however, that recently the dark energy survey released their three year data results and there they actually find remarkable agreement with the Planck measurement where the difference is less than 1.5 sigma by now. So depending on which weak lensing experiment you take, this discrepancy is larger or smaller, but it is still interesting to notice that there is this slight difference between the predicted value or the value we find from the CMB and the value we find with our weak lensing measurements. But apart from these derived parameters here where we have H0 and sigma 8, the CMB data we've obtained and our lambda CDM cosmology is remarkably consistent with data from many, many different data sets coming from many different scales. For an example, from baryon acoustic oscillations, you can see here all of the data points in different colors and the gray band in the middle is our prediction or our lambda CDM measurements based on the Planck mission. And you can see remarkable agreement. The same is true if we focus on the top right where I have redshift space distortion measurements Again, we can see the very good agreement with the band, which is the Planck measurements and the other measurements from different satellites, different missions. This is also true in the case of the overall luminosity of supernova as measured by the JLA and latest by the Pantheon data set. Once again, there is this remarkable consistency. We could also do this with many other data sets such as BBN. So th this is really why it is so difficult to try to explain the two discrepancies we mentioned before. We've seen that the Planck data is remarkably self-consistent across the many different, different components of the Planck data. 
The plank data is also remarkably consistent with other CMB missions, and it is consistent with BIO measurements, threats of space distortion, supernova, BBN. Before there are many, many different data sets that are in good agreement, and all of them are very compatible with Lambda CDM. This means that trying to solve these two discrepancies is extremely hard because any model you propose to reconcile the discrepancy in the expansion rate and the clustering parameter also has to be able to reproduce all of these data sets as well and Lambda CDM does. So the takeaway of this part so far is that the Planck data is remarkably consistent both with itself and with many, many external data sets. So up until now, we focus on Lambda CDM parameters. And now I want to focus on basic extensions to our Lambda CDM model. One extension that we can consider is including a tensor to scalar ratio. So this is where we have kind of a proxy to the gravitational wave background signal, these background primordial gravitational waves that we could have in the universe. So we introduce this new parameter R, which is this tensor to scalar ratio. And this allows us to study many different inflationary models. Now, the latest Planck data has found no evidence for any deviations beyond the most basic single field slow ball inflation. Planck found no running, no features, no non gaussianity, no hints of ISO curvature modes. Some people said it was possibly the most boring realization of inflation. Uh, and this is what the Planck satellite was able to tell us. In the figure here at the top, you can see the allowed parameter space for the tensor to scalar ratio and the primordial tilt given by different data sets. Can see that when we look at the blue one, which is including the best Planck data, data from the bicep Kekere, and BAO data, we have very, very stringent one and two sigma bounds on many different inflationary models. Indeed, many convex potentials, such as the most basic m square phi square potential, are no longer compatible with the latest CMB data from Planck. Now, it's expected in the future that having a B mode polarization measurement would allow us to improve these bounds by nearly one order of magnitude in terms of the tensor to scalar ratio, which means in the future, it's hopeful that this parameter space is available, parameter space would shrink even further, or maybe give us a detection of R, which would of course be nice. But I just want to highlight how far we've come, because I think sometimes we don't appreciate the progress because we gradually zoom in in our figures more and more. So this is what the latest constraints look like from Planck in 2018. But I just want to show you what this looked like 15 years ago when we had data from the WMAP 3 year, the year 3 release from WMAP, where you can see the allowed parameter space was substantially larger. If you focus here down in the bottom left, almost hidden, you can see comparatively where the bounds lie today. And I think this is remarkable how far we've come in terms of constraining inflation in just the last 15 years. So I think sometimes we zoom in so much we lose this bigger picture. So I just wanted to remind people of the remarkable progress we've made so far in terms of inflation, but this is expected to improve even more in the future when we get a B-mode measurement. Other extensions we can discuss the Lambda CDM cosmology come from adding extra relics into the game. So here we're talking about either massive relics in the form of massive neutrinos or massless relics whereby we increase the number of degrees of freedom in the universe. So on the left, you can see the constraints of H0 versus the sum of neutrino masses. In the right, you can see H0 versus this N effective parameter, which is this number of degrees of freedom we're adding to the universe. And the colors denote the sigma 8 value, this clustering parameter. So in terms of neutrino masses, the CMB cannot measure the individual neutrino masses, but it is highly sensitive to the sum of these neutrino masses. Just using the latest Planck data, we have been able to put constraints of the sum of neutrino masses smaller than 0.24 electron volts. When including external data sets such as BAO, this is further reduced to 0.12 electron volts. This is pushed even further if we included large scale structure data, such as Lyman alpha data. However, what we can see here is that this is already nearly one order of magnitude better than what can be done with, for an example, the Catherine direct experiment that is trying to measure the sum of neutrino masses. So cosmology really is sensitive to the sum of neutrino masses. And I just want to highlight here that going to larger neutrino masses allows us to find lower sigma 8 values, which could bring these weak lensing measurements into closer agreement or the CMB measurements into closer agreement with the weak lensing measurements. However, you'll notice that this comes at the expense of decreasing H0, which in turn makes the H0 tension worse. And I just want to mention that our current bounds from BAO do actually start to put a bit of danger on the inverted hierarchy scenario because we're approaching the point where we're close to excluding inverted hierarchy from cosmology. 
Focusing on the non-relativistic species, we can see that Planck provides a remarkable constraint on n effective of the, uh, finds a constraint of n effective to equal 2.89 plus minus 0 0.38. We can see that is, this is in remarkably good agreement with the predicted value of n effective equals 3.044. So once again, this is a prediction from our standard, uh, standard lambda CDM model, which has been verified, or our standard BBM cosmology, which has been verified by the Planck satellite. Now, once again, here we can see that when we increase n effective, what we can actually do is increase H0, which would allow us to bring the Planck measurements into better agreement with the direct measurements of the expansion rate of the universe. However, this comes at the, at the expense of increasing sigma 8, which means that we make the sigma 8 tension worse. So here you can really see this interplay again of how difficult it is to solve these tensions, because often when you find a model that can somewhat address the H0 tension, it makes sigma eight tension worse and vice versa. So it is very difficult to find models that can actually address both of these tensions without making each other worse. So now I want to focus on other extensions to lambda CDM. And now we can focus on different dark matter properties. One dark matter property that we can constrain very nicely with CMB data is possible dark matter annihilations. So here we have the assumption that dark matter is formed up of wind particles, which interact with the standard model only via the gravitational force and via the weak force. In this case, you can have several different annihilation channels whereby the dark matter can annihilate into standard model particles. Now, in these cases, the bounds we can obtain from the CMB, which come about from via the energy injection introduced by these dark matter annihilations, these bounds from the CMB are actually competitive with and complementary to indirect dark matter searches. <coughs> so what you can see here in the figure is the overall bound we can place on the cross section between the dark matter and the standard model particles as a function of the dark matter mass. You can see that the CMB excludes everything in the shaded region. And this, of course, depends, is dependent on which interaction channel, sorry, which annihilation channel you are focusing on. You can see here for comparison, for example, the results from the Fermi Hess, the results from AMS and Pamela, and even the region needed to explain the AMS anti proton excess or the Fermi Galactic Center excess. We can see that the CMB data already provides some constraints on these regions of parameter space you would need to explain these different signals. Now, one cool thing about this is that the biggest constraints in terms of dark matter annihilation actually come from the polarization spectrum of the CMB. So the Planck 2015 data was very, very good in terms of temperature, but the polarization wasn't as good. The Planck 2018 data really, really improved the polarization, the cleaning of the polarization spectra. So we were really able to extract more information from this EMO polarization spectrum. And this allowed us to push these annihilation bounds even further. So this means that in the future, when we get better measurements of the polarization spectrum, these bounds will be improved even more. Now, sticking with the theme of dark matter, other more complicated extensions we can focus on beyond lambda CDM is the idea of dark matter having potentially more interactions with standard model particles, not just weak interactions. Now, here we can consider interactions between dark matter photons, dark matter baryons, and dark matter and dark radiation, which would be a new component of the dark sector in the form of a massless species. The latest Planck data, however, finds no evidence for any of these interactions, both in single, double, and triple interacting models. What you can see here in the figure on the right is the overall constraints we can put on the cross section. So each sub panel here shows you the cross section or the, when we have two different cross sections turned on. So for an example, dark matter photon versus dark matter baryon interactions, dark matter dark radiation and dark matter baryons, or dark matter dark radiation and dark matter photon interactions. Once again, the contours are the one and two sigma bounds. And we can see that in the dual and triple interacting models, our constraints are very consistent and very stringent. So the Planck data finds no evidence for any interactions. And this is true regardless of how many interactions you turn on, or how many interacting channels you turn on simultaneously. Now, once again, this is somewhere where the Planck polarization data really shines. One clear example of this is dark matter, dark radiation interactions. Now, these have been proposed to try to address both the sigma eight and the H0 tension. And indeed, using Planck 2015 data, there was actually some hints and evidence that 
Dark matter dark radiation interactions could address both of these tensions simultaneously. However, the improved polarization measurements from Planck 2018 kind of ruled out these models as a solution to both of these tensions. So again, in the future, when we get better polarization measurements, it's expected that these bands will get even more stringent. Now, of course, up until now, we've focused mainly on, on Planck data, but Planck is not the full picture in terms of CMB measurements. Now, Planck was optimized to measure the temperature spectrum, which is why the error bars on the temperature spectrum, on the temperature anisotropies, are really, really small. The error bars on the polarization coming from Planck are slightly bigger, because it just wasn't optimized as much for polarization. Now, we currently have ongoing missions such as the Akatamo Telescope and the South Pole Telescope, which are pushing our bounds on the polarization. These are ground-based missions, which allows them to cover a smaller region of the sky, but with better angular resolution. So these missions are providing better data at high multipoles for the temperature spectrum and improved polarization measurements. It's also helpful that in the future we'll gain more measurements of the CMB B mode polarization spectrum, which would really allow us to push the constraints on many different models. So what you can see here is that the Planck data is remarkably consistent with WMAP data, with Akatama, or South Pole Telescope, all of this data is remarkably self-consistent. So what I want you to take away from this part of the talk is that we have gained a lot of information from all of the CMB measurements we have but we have not yet got all of the information possible out of the CMB measurements. There are still more to give us. And I'm not going to go into detail about Akatama and South Pole Telescope because there, are, there is a dedicated talk about these, so do check out the other talk about these, these other missions. So now I want to change gears slightly and focus on CMB spectral distortions. Now, in terms of CMB spectral distortions, it's perhaps less well known as the anisotropies. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our very nice temperature anisotropies. These are the amazing anisotropies as measured by Planck. And I'm going to do the very nice thing and blur them out. So I'm just going to average out the sky. So now what I'm interested in is not so much the anisotropies, but this overall spectral of the CMB. So the overall black body radiation within the CMB. Now the CMB is an almost perfect black body. In fact, <coughs> It is the most perfect black body we have found to date. However, it is not completely perfect. There are tiny, tiny, tiny deviations from this perfect black body, which could be caused by anything that injects energy within the universe. Now, these injected energy mechanisms can cause different scatterings to become inefficient, can affect number changing processes. So any process that changes the overall energy of the CMB could produce a distortion to this perfect black body. And these spectral distortions contain a wealth of information. Now, the primordial spectral distortion signal is frozen at the time of decoupling. It is largely unaffected by physics that happens since the time of decoupling. This means that CMB spectral distortions provide a unique window into the early universe. They really do provide a whole other way of studying early universe physics. Now, depending what time in the universe these distortions come about, they, they can have slightly different properties. In the very early universe, distortions mainly present as a temperature shift. At this point, the photons can basically rescatter efficiently, and the only net effect you get to an energy injection is an overall shift of the average black body temperature. These are, of course, remarkably difficult to measure because the net effect would just be a shifting of the average temperature. Later on in the universe, any injected energy could produce a distortion which would affect the Compton scattering. So we call these Compton like or Y distortions. Later on in the universe, we would have chemical potential distortions or mu distortions. Now, these are, of course, not completely disentangled. There will be periods within the universe where you have both Y and mu distortions, and you kind of have this flux in between where you cannot completely disentangle these distortions. Any distortion that does not fall into this category, we call a residual distortion, and we also need to account for this within our calculations. Now, spectral distortions can be caused by many processes, both within lambda CDM, and in many exotic scenarios. This means that on the one hand, they provide a unique test of lambda CDM cosmology, and they provide a probe of many, many extended models. So this is a prediction that lambda CDM makes. Lambda CDM predicts a spectral distortion signal. If we do not measure the spectral distortion signal predicted by lambda CDM, lambda CDM is wrong. This is an unequivocal test of our lambda CDM cosmology. 
Now within lambda CDM, on average, we expect distortions of the order of 10 to the minus eight. These come about from effects such as the adiabatic cooling of electrons and baryons, the overall dissipation of acoustic rays throughout the universe, and the sonyarov zeldovich effect, which is perhaps the most significant within lambda CDM, because here the signal could even go up to about 10 to the minus six. In exotic scenarios, again, non-exhaustive list here, the overall average signal we expect is of the order of 10 to the minus nine. This can be produced by many, many different inflationary models, by many different dark matter properties, such as dark matter annihilation, dark matter interactions, dark matter decay, which would push the signal over by a couple of orders of magnitude as well, would it enhance the signal. And of course, these spectral distortions also come about when you form primordial black holes or when these evaporate. This means that primordial, that spectral distortions are able to constrain all of these extended models, as well as providing a test of lambda CDM cosmology. So of course, the next question is, what have we been able to measure with CMB distortions? Now, the current only bound we have on CMB spectral distortions comes from the FIROS mission, which was part of the COBE satellite, the COBE FIROS satellite. The bound we have is from 25 years ago, from 1996, when they provided a bound of mu and y smaller than 10 to the minus 5. Now, I do not want to downplay the significance of this measurement because this was a remarkably good measurement at the time, and it did really allow us to solidify this idea that any distortions to the black body have to be really, really small. So this was a remarkable measurement, but it is also a measurement that is 25 years old. And this is a place where the observation is really lagging behind the theory. We can theoretically calculate the predicted spectral distortion signal in many models. In fact, one of the most well-known cosmology codes class now features the computation of spectral distortions by default. So this is something where we have the theoretical groundwork, but we haven't had a measurement in 25 years. And what you can see here in the figure in the right is the overall signal predicted for these, the overall spectral distortion signal predicted in different scenarios. In blue and red, you can see lambda CDM processes such as baryon cooling or the dissipation of acoustic waves. In green and blue, you can see what we can find in exotic scenarios such as the annihilation of dark matter or the decay of dark matter. Now, there have been several missions proposed in order to get this measurement. Pixie was proposed to have a sensitivity of 10 to the minus eight. PRISM would have had a sensitivity of 10 to the minus nine. Neither of these received funding. It's unlikely that either will actually fly. But there is still hope. In the ESA Voyage 2050 call for applications, there was a white paper expressing interest for a CMB spectral distortion mission. Depending on the funding it would receive and the, the type of mission that, that they could build, they could push the sensitivity down to 10 to the minus 10. So there is hope. And honestly, I am hopeful that within my generation, we will get a spectral distortion mission. Now, there is one problem to spectral distortions, which are foregrounds. Foregrounds are extremely difficult to remove. This is a place where the signal to noise ratio is low, and we do have a lot of background noise to deal with. Ideally, what we would like is to have a low frequency ground based measurement, such as a pathfinder mission, to allow us to clean up the sky for potential future flying mission, which would then be able to really measure these spectral distortions. I'm hopeful that we will get this Pathfinder and spectral distortion mission in the future. So if we were to get such a mission, what could we do with it? So what could we do with a spectral distortion measurement? Now, one thing we can do is constrain many different inflationary models. Now, this co these constraints are both on the main inflationary parameters, such as AS and NS, and also the running, where we have N1, but also on the overall shape of the inflationary potential. So in terms of the individual parameters, what you can see in the figure on the left is what we could do with Planck alone, with Planck plus Fira, so these are the measurements we have. And with a Pixie-like mission in the future, remember this is something that could be superseded by a Voyage mission. And in yellow, what, in red, you can see what we could do with future CMB anisotropy missions, and in yellow, what we could do with future CMB anisotropies plus a spectral distortion measurement. And what you can appreciate here is that the bounds on AS and NS would not change substantially. They would change, but not substantially. But the bound on the running, we could improve by up to one order of magnitude with respect to an anisotropy only mission. Now, in terms of the overall shape of the primordial power spectrum, CMB anisotropies are sensitive within the range of 10 to the minus four to about one in K space. Primor um, spectral distortion, sorry, could extend this level arm by four orders of magnitude allowing us to push these constraints up to 10 to the four. 
Next, we really allows us to constrain four orders of magnitude more of the shape of the primordial power spectrum. What you can see in the figure on the right is the type of area or the, the allowed parameter space for the shape of the primordial power spectrum for different missions. In yellow is what we could do if we had a prism-like mission within the future. Now, of course, the overall shape of the primordial power spectrum is extremely important for primordial black hole production. Indeed, you need a specific shape of this potential, of this primordial power spectrum, sorry, in order to produce primordial black holes, which means these bounds can also have dramatic consequences for the production of primordial black holes. Another place where spectral distortions really shine is in constraining dark matter properties, such as decaying dark matter. So here I'm considering the scenario where we have a fraction of dark matter that decays with a specific lifetime. Now, the energy injection history is going to be very dependent on the lifetime of the decaying dark matter particle. Now, this is a place where the bounds coming from CMB anisotropies and the bounds coming from spectral distortions are completely disentangled. What you can see here in the figure is the excluded what we can do. So the colored regions are excluded with different missions. In blue, you can see Planck plus Ferus. In green, what we could do with Planck plus Pixie. And in yellow, what we could do in the future with ground-based measurements from light, from CMB stage four, a space-based mission of Lightbird, and a spectral distortion mission of PRISM. And here, if you look at the lifetime to 10 to the 13, everything above a lifetime of 10 to the 13 is already very nicely constrained by CMB anisotropies. But everything with a lifetime smaller than 10 to the 13 can be constrained more accurately with CMB spectral distortions. In fact, in some regions of parameter space, these CMB spectral distortions can improve on the anisotropy measurements by three to four orders of magnitude. Even if we include things like BBN, which push these bounds a bit further, spectral distortions still outperform these other probes by three to four orders of magnitude. So this is somewhere where you can really appreciate the synergy between anisotropies and distortions because they allow us to probe different regions of parameter space. So even though they can constrain the same models, Spectral distortions would allow us to focus on a different region of parameter space that we haven't been able to properly study yet. Now, going back to models that we focused on before, another thing we can constrain with CMB spectral distortions are dark matter interactions. Indeed, these will affect any dark matter interactions with standard model particles, will affect the adiabatic cooling effect, which will in turn affect the spectral distortion signal. Now, we can place very, very competitive bounds. We could hypothetically place competitive bounds with a pixie-like mission on dark matter proton interaction, dark matter electron interaction, and dark matter photon interaction. This is what you can see in the figure on the top here. Everything above these lines is excluded. In solid lines, you can see the bounds we already have from Firas. And in dashed lines, you can see what we could do with a pixie-like mission. Of course, a voyage-like mission would push this even more. In the case of dark matter photon interactions, for an example, these bounds would be very competitive and complementary to bounds obtained using other probes such as Milky Way satellites. Now, one interesting thing is that this allows us to really probe low mass regions. So the anisotropy bounds I showed before were focusing on masses of the order of GeV. Whereas here we can really go down to small MeV mass dark matter. So again, these spectral distortions allow us to constrain a whole other region of parameter space. So this once again highlights the potential of a spectral distortion mission. There are so many different models we could constrain with such a measurement. So this brings me to my conclusion. I hope I've convinced you by now that the CMB contains a treasure trove of information about the early universe. There are many different aspects of CMB physics, many different observables we obtain, and they will really allow us to unmask the physics of the early universe. The different CMB anisotropy spectra, the temperature, polarization, lensing of spectrum, are in remarkable agreement. They are very, very self-consistent. They are also very consistent with many external data sets. However, there are some small tensions when we consider derived parameters, such as the expansion rate of the universe, and the overall clustering of matter. Now, the latest Planck data has found absolutely no evidence for any extensions beyond lambda CDM. It has basically found the most boring realization of lambda CDM possible, vanilla lambda CDM with no extensions. Now, despite the remarkable amount of information obtained from the anisotropies, there is still an untapped resource in the CMB in the form of spectral distortions. These are there just waiting for us to measure them. We have not measured them in 25 years. 
and this would allow us to constrain many, ex many extended models, as well as providing an um, unequivocal test of lambda CDM physics. So CMB spectral distortions are just there waiting for us, and I'm hopeful that in the future we will get a mission. And if there's one thing I want you to take away from this talk, it's that the CMB has told us a lot, but the journey is not yet over. We are getting better polarization measurements. Hopefully in the future, we will get BMO polarization measurements and even spectral distortion measurements. So even though the CMB has told us a lot, there is still a lot more to tell us. So stay tuned because the CMB has not finished the story yet. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and say that I'm happy to answer any and all questions you have, both on the Slack channel and in the discussion session. I look forward to your questions and thank you for listening.